All right, thank you so much for that, Sarah. That was a wonderful talk. And I think what we could also do is um, take some of those handouts. I know a lot of the, uh, the participants will wanna get, dive a little deeper into those handouts um, for your own patients. Um, we are now going to transition from the minimally invasive to the moderately invasive uh, therapies for reflux. Our next speaker, uh, you've all seen him, uh, Dr. Charu Pranjbe is my uh, course co-director. He's the uh, Associate Chief of Surgery and the Chief of uh, GI Surgery at Newton Wellesley Hospital, and he will be talking about endoluminal therapy for reflux. Thank you, Kumar. Uh, thanks for that introduction. So we're going to be moving from uh, dietary interventions to slightly different interventions, and then we will move on to minimally invasive laparoscopic uh, interventions in the next talk. Um, I have no disclosures for my speech. If you look at the, the pro progression of GERD uh, from a normal LES to all the way going into complications such as erosive esophagitis, strictures, Barrett's, and so on and so forth, and ultimately cancer, um, you know, in the similar lines, there is obviously TPIs on one side, and then there is uh, minimally invasive, either laparoscopic and robotic surgery uh, on the other side. There, is there something in the middle which is not as in, invasive as, as the other side of the surgery? And the answer is yes. And about 15 years ago, uh, this was a great interest uh, that, that generated a lot of uh, interest and in, uh, it was a hot bed, bed for research uh, in the endoscopic therapy of GERD. And as, as a result, we saw multiple devices that actually came in the market that included endoscopic suturing device, the NDO plicator, the anti-reflux device by Cynthian, the his vis device, the Enterex procedure, the gatekeeper procedure, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, for multiple reasons, these most of these devices sort of faded away. And over time, there, there have been a few that have stayed and they have proved their value in the, in the whole spectrum of reflux disease. And we're gonna talking, we're gonna be talking about the TIF procedure in this talk. Um, I have been doing this procedure since 2009 and have had a fair amount of experience since. Essentially, <clears throat> we're going to summarize this in this slide and then uh, see a one-minute video of how it's done. Uh, but essentially, there are no incisions and is done transorally, and the esophagus device <clears throat> gets uh, inserted into the mouth, and it has an arm that kind of flexes. And as you can see in these pictures, it delivers etch-shaped fasteners across the cirrhosa uh, from the stomach into the esophagus and basically plicates this and causes an internal uh, approximately 270 degree valve or wrap or the, the fundoplication. And it results into a two to three centimeter uh, sort of a robust wrap as shown here. This is how the actual device looks like. This is the uh, recent uh, modification version of it. Uh, it looks like a <clears throat> big uh, piece, obviously, but then the endoscope will go right through this uh, opening here and, and go through this tube and will end up here. And then it retroflexes to cause <clears throat> this kind of a uh, firing mechanism where there is a screw uh, that comes out of the end, along with there are the fasteners, as you can see here, that are deployed from here. As we all know, one short video can replace multiple words. We're going to looking at this video real quick. Body's natural physical barrier to reflux. Inserted through the mouth, the esophix device is used to construct a durable anti-reflux valve, re-establishing a natural barrier to reflux. TIF is surgery without incisions or the complications associated with more invasive surgical procedures. TIF is performed under constant visualization by the surgeon. While the patient is under general anesthesia, 
the esophix device riding over the endoscope is gently glided down through the patient's mouth into the stomach. The stomach is inflated and the endoscope is advanced and turned so that it is looking up at the entrance to the stomach. This is where the anti-reflux valve will be created. The tissue mold is then advanced into the stomach. The tissue retractor is engaged at the Z line, a line that marks where the esophagus and stomach come together. The tissue is retracted into the tissue mold. Some patients may have a small hiatal hernia, a condition where a portion of the stomach has migrated up through the diaphragm into the chest cavity. If present, hiatal hernia can be reduced and the esophagus can be lengthened by retracting the endoscope up into the esophagus. Suction is then engaged and the stomach is then repositioned down below the diaphragm. The esophix device is then rotated, wrapping the fundus toward the lesser curvature of the stomach. Under visual control, the esophix device is then used to deploy two H-shaped fasteners to hold the fold of tissue in place and maintain the wrap. The wrap is then tightened further and the next pair of fasteners are placed one centimeter above the Z-line. This procedure is repeated on the opposing side. The valve is extended, creating a long three to five centimeter flap and securing it with H-shaped fasteners. TIP is long lasting. Studies show that in the weeks following TIP, a natural healing process called serosal fusion occurs. Body's natural physical bear. So with that, um, you know, now that we've understood how it's done, <clears throat> let's try to see uh, some of the literature about this and what it shows. So there have been a lot of studies, as you can see here, uh, regarding the TIF and its efficacy and outcomes. We're going to concentrate on two studies. One was uh, one was called a template trial. Essentially, one arm of the patients they got the TIF esophix fundoplication. The other arm uh, got the PPIs, um, and it was a randomized multicenter trial in seven different centers in the United States. Um, this is the summary of what it actually showed, and um, we're going to go into the details in a minute. But essentially, the TEMPO trial looked at the outcomes at three years and at five years. Uh, there was a significant improvement in regurgitation uh, symptoms of the patients who got the TIF, and it was stable at year five. At year one, 88% of the patients had improvement in regurgitation for the patients who had uh, the TIF. At year five, it dropped a little bit, but it was still significantly high, 86%. At baseline, all the patients were on PPIs. The PPI use increased over the years. So at year one, it was 17% of patients went back on PPIs, and then it increased to approximately 34% at end of year five. These numbers are actually not different from the multiple studies that we see on laparoscopic hiatal hernia replacement fundoplication. And next few slides will just go over some of the details of what we uh, what we see. So essentially, this is a, a early outcome: uh, a 97% versus 93% at 12 months for the regurgitation symptoms. That was uh, there were elimination of those symptoms. And over, again, over five years, as we saw, they, it, it sort of dipped a little bit, but it was still very high. 86% of patients had complete elimination of the regurgitation symptoms. Uh, there was also improvement in atypical symptoms in, in the patients who got the, the TIF. This is a 12-month follow-up. Um, but the most important thing was the typical heartburn symptoms. This is a short-term uh, data uh, that showed approximately 86% uh, uh, improvement. And at the end of year five, we, we had significant improvement that was sustained over time. Uh, we looked at the PPI data already. We're gonna jump to the second study, which is the RESPECT trial. This was a randomized trial of this, uh, the patients got either esophix or a sham procedure. And then what was followed by either a PPI or a placebo controlled uh, uh, medications. Basically, it showed that at the six months, 67% of the patients randomized to TIF were off of PPI considered, compared with the 47% of those. 
76% of the sham group elected to ultimately cross over and got a TIP after 12 months. And 72% of the treater patients achieved control of regurgitation again uh, that were uh, PPI free. I'm going to skip this, but it's essentially at the conclusion, the troublesome re regurgitation symptom was resolved in a greater proportion of patients who got uh, the TIP pr procedure rather than omeprazole. It was safe, the complication rates were low, and they recommended that we should consider patients with either no hernia or small hat or hernia to have the TIP procedure. If you look at the outcomes from many, all these different studies, so not just these two trials, but the other outcomes, which are actually comparable to our outcomes that we have done over the many years, the most important thing to see is the quality of life. You can see a dramatic improvement in the quality of life. Uh, the lower the quality scores, the better they are. And as you can see, the quality of life after GERD significantly improves and it sustains. It also causes healing of the esophagitis as shown in multiple studies. And if you look at multiple studies, you can see a sustain almost close to 80%. It's about 75 to 80% depending on the studies. But if you look at multiple uh, studies, 80% of the patients, close to 80% are off of PPIs in the long term. This procedure can be done as an outpatient basis uh, or you know, maximally a day, one day uh, stay in the hospital. Uh, it is cost effective compared to the laparoscopic approach as seen here. The major complications are, are low. The general complication rates in all these studies was close to 3.2%, uh, which included bleeding, uh, uh, bloating, inability to uh, belch, things like that, but it's very low. Uh, the, the dysphagia rates were significantly low, as you can imagine, with a 270 degree wrap. And the reoperations were considered to be due to the case selection. We're going to spend a minute there uh, for a second. Um, the serious adverse events reported were extremely low, so over 70,000 procedures done. Uh, there was a very low of 0.4% uh, uh, rate of serious adverse events. Most of them were done early during the course of the esophix one device, which was very cumbersome and was technically difficult to do. They have uh, now a newer version that's much easier and much more user-friendly. As with any other procedures, you know, TIF has its challenges, and I would like to highlight a few of them. Um, it has progressed through different me mechanisms and designs, and so there is a learning curve to that. There was initially some insurance issues and long waiting time for the approval, which is now has been improved with the Medicare and other private insurances uh, approving uh, this all across 50 states. The key point is to to select the patient correctly. And, and for this, the, the, the notation of a small hiatal hernia needs to be abandoned in my opinion, because in my opinion, what is a small hiatal hernia? Nobody knows. If, if a gastroenterologist has done the endoscopy and then somebody else does the endoscopy, typically the surgeons will measure the hernia, but in, 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 in the gastroenterology world, typically they just, it's a small, medium, large, and that creates confusion and also creates uh, a problem in selecting the, the patient. Because going back to our problem, if you hypothetically do a TIF in a patient who has a decent hiatal or hernia, over time, this whole thing, all wrap can slip up in the chest and the patients will still have uh, reflux symptoms. The dietary modifications that you just heard from Sarah are the key, regardless of any anti-reflux surgery. Typically, because the patients don't have incisions, it doesn't hurt, they think that, oh, it's not a big deal, and they would uh, sometimes overeat or do other things, uh, which is, uh, we always stress with our patients that this is still a procedure and that you have to follow all these things to have ultimate uh, good outcome. It is a two-person coordination in the operating room, and so uh, you have to make sure that uh, there is good dynamics inside the OR and outside the OR. What I mean by that is, uh, as you know, um, that the, the gastroenterology and surgery, we have to work together 
to, to make multiple things happen. And TIFF is a great example of that, where the team approach, not just in the operating room, but even outside the operating room is important. And so uh, TIFF actually brings this together. As a summary, I would like to say that TIFF is a very viable option for the right patient. Like I said, the case selection is the key. Uh, typically, very minimal centimeter uh, or so uh, hiatal hernia or no hiatal hernia is the right patient to, to have the selection. There was a learning curve. It's getting uh, better with the new design. The reimbursement has improved significantly because all the payers now approve it. The complication rates are uh, uh, low. We talked about the team dynamics. And most importantly, we have to remember that this is not a, a, a standalone therapy. It goes with all the things that we've been talking about in this conference, the lifestyle adjustment, the diet adjustment, and the multidisciplinary care that ultimately leads to the great outcomes. Thank you again and appreciate it.